snorkel, check. Scuba diving kit, check. Time machine, check. Okay, I think we're all set. Just make sure you don't get eaten or tentacled or crushed or frozen or burnt, and I think we'll be fine. Welcome to the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory. Welcome to the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory, the podcast that provides top travel tips for time travellers. I'm your tour guide, David Mountain. For this episode, we've travelled all the way back to the Ordovician, a period of our planet's history that stretched from 485 to 444 million years ago. If the Cambrian is when complex life gets into gear, the Ordovician is when it puts its foot on the gas. Life is larger, more complex, more dangerous than it's ever been before. The Earth, too, is dynamic, shifting from a tropical hothouse at the start of the Ordovician to a frozen ice age by the close of the period. Life is forced to contend with plummeting temperatures, shifting sea levels, cosmic bombardment, and the first mass extinction in our planet's history. It can be a little wild at times, but the Ordovician is the original adventure holiday. To help me make sense of the Ordovician, I've brought along two experts. Dr Lucy McCobb, a paleontologist at the National Museum in Cardiff. Hello. And Professor Dave Harper, a paleontologist at Durham University. Hello there. Before we quite literally dive in, however, the usual disclaimers about Paleozoic travel. First, remember to bring your own supply of oxygen, especially if you're planning to visit the first half of the period, when oxygen levels were about three quarters of what they are today. Second, you can leave that alarm clock at home. 450 million years ago, the Earth was spinning on its axis significantly faster than today, meaning that the days were noticeably shorter, lasting around 22 hours. This is a pretty effective way of scrambling your body clock, so if you're planning to stay for any length of time, do be prepared for some pretty horrendous jet lag. Coffee and painkillers are strongly advised. And third and finally, you really do need to bring some sort of submersible with you, or at least a boat, if you really want to make the most of your holiday. It's true that the Ordovician is home to some of the very earliest terrestrial life, but honestly, it's nothing to write home about just yet. For the real excitement and drama, you need to head into the oceans. Welcome aboard the Morella, this podcast's very own time-travelling submersible. And here with me in the control room are Lucy and Dave. So, first things first, what animals are we most likely to find as we explore the shallow seas of the Ordovician. So as you scan the seabed, you're likely to see patches of things which might look a bit like reefs, so if you kind of swim in close to those and have a closer look, you'll spot that there's not that many corals there, actually. There's quite a few sponges and algae and perhaps some sea mats or bryozoans, but only the odd coral here and there. And then if you swim in close to some of the other patches, you'll notice actually they look a bit like starfish on the end of stalks. And these are things called sea lilies or crinoids. And you can see whole swathes of these on the sea floor, just like waving their arms and capturing food. And then I think once you get your eye in a bit more and look more closely, you might see amongst these reefs, you'll see things like trilobites, bristle worms, sea snails, and perhaps starfish crawling around. On the seabed itself, you like to see lots of shellfish, so brachiopods particularly, but also clams um, and other shellfish. If you're lucky, you might spot a fish. They'd probably look a bit like a large tadpole, maybe with a bony plate over the head. Or you might see some that look a bit like skinny eels, quite thin looking things. Or if you're very lucky, you might even see a sea scorpion as well. And I think maybe if you're looking out into the waters a bit more, you'll see things that look maybe a bit like algae floating around. But these are actually things called graptolites. And they're actually animals, colonial animals, which have got lots of tiny little animals filter feeding. They're kind of in the plankton, really floating around but really, really common. 
And there's predators on the scene already. We have the orthoconic uh, nautiloids, pretty big guys, and we'll come back to that later probably. But also the conodonts, which were rather nasty sorts of creatures. And they're rather like the hagfish today. They didn't have functional jaws, but they stuck themselves onto the side of organisms and sort of sucked them out. And so we have a tremendous diversity on the actual seabed itself with suspension feeding organisms already, a lot of other organisms moving around between them. And also the water column is becoming filled up with lots of other sorts of organisms, amongst them predators. And so I like to think that modern ecosystems are really coming online during the Ordovician. So there's already a lot of diversity in the Ordovician, even though this is still early on in the Paleozoic. So we have a thing called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, and I like to call it um, Biodiversity's Big Bang, because lots and lots of organisms suddenly appear at the level of families, at the level of genera, at the level of species. Do we know what's caused or what may have caused this event? Um, very good question. <laughs> There's a number of schools of thought. And I have to say at the outset that there are a number of groups working on the Ordovician that believe that perhaps there was one very major biodiversification event in the middle part of the Ordovician. And that opens up the question as to what actually caused it. And is it a rapid increase in oxygen levels? Is it a fall in temperature? It could be volcanicity. It could be asteroid impacts. On the other hand, um, there's a more gradual model in which it's all to do with the relationships between organisms. And so things like changes in the trophic chain, so more and more phyto and zooplankton are diversifying, radiating, and they're feeding the benthos. The predators that appear, they put a lot of pressure on organisms. Organisms have to adapt themselves. They have to grow thicker shells, and more ornament on their shells. They may have to run faster, swim faster, or actually burrow down into the sediment. And so you get a, a radiation of life as organisms change and adapt and evolve to avoid these predators. I personally think that we don't know enough about the Ordovician. I think we tend to be very focused on Baltica and Laurentia, two big continents that we have a lot of data from. And there's many parts of the world that we just simply don't know enough about just at the moment. Once all the gaps are filled in, I would suspect that the actual biodiversification is longer and more gradual than just one major hike in biodiversification. You mentioned the conodonts and their fairly nasty way of life. And this has got me thinking. In a previous episode, I visited the Cambrian. And apart from a few nibbly anomalous carids, it was a pretty safe holiday destination. But it sounds like this might not be the case for the Ordovician. So are there any animals other than the conodonts that a backpacker should look out for if they're snorkeling or scuba diving? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Life in the shallow seas and get out there with your bathing gear on, get the mask on and have a bit of a swim around. I would be pretty scared of some of these big nautiloids because some of them grow to several meters long. I think the largest one has been recorded at nine meters long. And these are sort of related to the squids. And, you know, if I was swimming along and I, I looked over my shoulder and I saw a shadow, I might get pretty scared of some of these guys. Fishes are already around, but they tend to be bottom dwelling, the big heavy armored guys. So I'm not sure they'd particularly bother me unless I stood on them, I guess. If the thought of getting tangled up in orthocone tentacles or sucked dry by conodonts leaves you a little uneasy, I'm sorry to say that it's not much safer on dry land. Among other things, the Ordovician is notable for the huge number of meteors that slam into the Earth, at a rate that's about 100 times that of today. 
This seems to have reached a peak around 467 million years ago, when our planet endured an intense period of bombardment, caused, perhaps, by some sort of enormous collision in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. If you happen to find yourself in the path of an oncoming asteroid, well, let's just say that coffee and painkillers aren't going to make you feel that much better this time. Besides, not everything below the waves is as sinister as those nightmare plungers the conodonts. Indeed, there's one group of animals that I would love to meet, and that's the trilobites. They're probably the most iconic animals of the Paleozoic, and undoubtedly some of the most recognisable animals from all of prehistory. Lucy, in my guidebook it says that trilobites look like giant underwater woodlice. But what's their real family tree? What animals are trilobites most closely related to? Well, the guidebook's right in that they do superficially look a lot like woodlice, only quite often a bit bigger. And they both belong in the same major group of animals. So there's a group of animals called arthropods, which they're basically all of those animals that have got a hard outer shell and lots of legs, so your crustaceans and so on. But the woodlice are actually, they are a type of crustacean actually, so they're related to crabs and lobsters. And we don't think those are the closest related to the trilobites. We actually think the modern horseshoe crabs are the most closely related to trilobites. And the reason for that is that the horseshoe crabs have got a larval stage that has got three lobes that actually looks quite like a trilobite. Um, it's slightly tenuous <laughs> because trilobites are extinct, we can't be certain, but that's what we think. How likely am I to bump into a trilobite? Say if I'm just paddling in the shallow seas or I go for a bit of scuba diving, are they common or do you have to hunt around a bit? Trilobites were fairly common in the Ordovician, and the other thing about them was that they adapted to kind of live in different environments as well, so lots of them made their living in different ways. So if you were maybe scuba diving over a reef, you would see some crawling in amongst the sponges and so on there. I think that would be quite a good place to look. Or perhaps down in the mud at the bottom of the seabed, they might be grubbing around. Or some of them did actually swim just free in the water, but maybe they would be a bit harder to spot those ones. Probably the reef is your best bet, I think, <laughs> to look for trilobites. And how big are we talking? What's the size range for trilobites in the Ordovician? Well, the smallest ones, which are, they're slightly debatable if they are trilobites, actually are things called agnostids, which are really tiny, about the size of a pea almost. They were really simplified and they were actually floating in the plankton, so you probably wouldn't have had much chance of actually spotting those. But the biggest ones actually got up to um, over half a metre long, so pretty big. But on average, I would say most of them probably a couple of inches or couple of centimetres. Okay. Up to maybe five centimetres or something. But yeah, they did have a big size range. For a backpacker who's been going around the Phanerozoic, you can sometimes get a bit disorientated as to whenabouts you are in prehistory. So are there any distinguishing features or evolutionary trends of trilobites in the Ordovician? Can you look at a certain trilobite and say, that's probably from the Ordovician based on how it looks? Yeah, there are a couple of quite distinct groups of trilobites in the Ordovician. So I think the most distinctive are the trinucleids, one called trinucleus, and then there are various other ones as well. And they had this really weird kind of fringe, uh, flat fringe around their head. It looks a bit like a sun visor, really, but it's full of all these rows of holes. Very bizarre looking thing. We don't really know what those holes were for, actually. They might have been used for filter feeding, or maybe they used them just with little sensory hairs to figure out what was going on. But they're very bizarre things, and you only see those in the Ordovician, so they're quite a good indicator, really. We also have some interesting trilobites called cyclopygids, I guess named after cyclops, because they've got these huge eyes, and they're very streamlined, so they're free swimming in the water. And absolutely amazing vision, so as well as seeing sort of around their head, they could see above and below it as well, almost like a dragonfly's really massive eyes. And we think they probably live down in the depths of the dark ocean. And these eyes were just to capture as much of that light as they possibly could, you know, where they were living down in the dim depths. But yeah, those are two quite distinctive trilobites that were around at that time. I'm glad you mentioned eyes, because to me, probably the most remarkable thing about trilobites are their eyes. Could you explain how exactly they worked? Because they're not at all like human eyes. No, that's right. So we just have a single lens in our eyes, but trilobites have what are known as compound eyes. And so they had lots of individual lenses making up the eye. So if you've ever looked at an insect's eye, for example, then you'll see that they're made of lots of little compartments. And those are actually individual lenses that come together to make the eye. 
But the trilobite's slightly different from insects because each lens in a trilobite's eye is actually a single crystal of a mineral called calcite. So it's the mineral that's actually really common in nature. It's in a lot of shells, like seashells and so on. But they had a single crystal for each lens, which I think is pretty cool. That's amazing. And there were lots and lots of lenses in these trilobite eyes, weren't there? It wasn't just two or three. Yeah, some had hundreds of lenses. You can imagine that built up quite a good mosaic picture of the environment, yeah. So I'm thinking in practical terms here, if I want to try and get close to a trilobite and it's a species with good eyes, would they see me coming a mile off and just scuttle away before I even got close to them? I mean, it's not as if my movements are particularly graceful or subtle in the water. Some people have tried to take photographs through the lenses of trilobite eyes, believe it or not. <laughs> so we know that optically they were pretty good and they, they could see light and dark areas and they could make out shapes as well. So I suspect you would struggle actually to sneak up on these trilobites which had um, big eyes. You might have better luck if you're into deep sea diving though, because down there, there were actually some trilobites that were blind. They'd lost their eyes during evolution. So as well as these trilobites with giant eyes down there, you might find some that didn't have eyes at all. So you might have better luck, I think. Dave, brachiopods have already come up in conversation today. For someone who's never been to the Ordovician or the Paleozoic before, but they want to find these brachiopods, what should they be looking out for? I mean, what makes a brachiopod a brachiopod? Well, if they're going back to the Paleozoic, and um, what often textbooks say is, well, they're a bit like a, a clam, except they're not a clam. And so basically, they have two shells, a dorsal and a ventral shell. But what differentiates them from the clams, from the bivalves, is they don't have a foot, but they have a hairy feeding organ called a lophophore. And they would be opening and closing their shells, and the lophophore would be extending out to attract particles and move the particles back into the mouth. So essentially, you, you're looking for shellfish but you're looking for shellfish with this very distinctive feeding apparatus. The other thing is that the vast majority of the brachiopods would be stuck very firmly onto the seabed. They can't actually move. And so either by a stalk, which we call a peticle, or perhaps they're just lying in the mud in a stationary position. So relatively few brachiopods, apart from perhaps the non-articulate um, lingulids that can actually dig into the sediment, most brachiopods are pretty stationary. And so you'd have a wonderful time. They're not going to run away from you. And you'd be able to look at these shell beds and just watch them quietly feed as they open and close their valves and the lophophore comes out. So I think it would be a marvellous sight just to be patient and watch them feeding. Now, we've been talking about swimming, scuba diving, snorkeling. So just on a practical note, how chilly are the waters going to be? Because I know it was an ice age during the Ordovician. So was it cold or were there still warmer waters around? Well, I think there's a couple of aspects that are quite interesting. A lot of our attention is paid to um, Laurentia, Baltica, to a certain extent, Avalonia, Siberia, some of the big continents, South China, these sorts of places. And they would have been at relatively temperate to low latitudes. And so it would have been quite pleasant, particularly in Laurentia, I would imagine, as Baltica moved towards the equator during the Ordovician. Again, I don't think they need to wrap up and, and put on a, um, a dry suit or anything. They'd be able to swim around quite comfortably. That's the first point. The second point I'd make is that during the Ordovician, we're finding out more and more about the temperature of the water through isotopes, particularly oxygen isotopes. And it would seem that early on in the Ordovician, in the Lake Cambrian, the waters were pretty warm. And there's been some temperatures between, well, as great as 60 degrees centigrade, which wow. is almost going to boil you. I think 50 to 40 is probably more realistic. But as we go through the Ordovician, there is a cooling. And by the time, as you quite rightly say, we get to the end of the Ordovician, there is a major ice age. And certainly, once you move out to the tropics and towards the poles, I think it would start to get pretty chilly. Okay, so if you're looking for a beach holiday, stick to the mid-latitudes and go earlier in the period. I think Laurentia is your best bet. Okay, sounds good. 
Now, another defining feature of the Ordovician, we have this great biodiversification. We also have the first mass extinction in Earth's history. So do we know what caused this, what might have caused it? Or again, is this one of those questions that we still need more information on? Yeah, I, I think we know a lot about the causes, but we don't know enough about the cause of the causes, if I could put it that way. So in the case of the Ordovician, over a period, we think it was quite short now in terms of maybe 100,000 years. Previously, we thought it was about a million years, but some new dating coming out shows that it was much shorter. There were two phases, and the first phase was the major cooling event. We see a lot of the warm water faunas are hit quite badly, but we also see the deep water faunas as well were attacked by this um, particular event, which is a little bit mystifying because it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive. So certainly about 75% of species actually disappear during this um, first phase and focused on some of the, the, the warm shells and the deeper water environments. So why did this happen? Well, the cooling event certainly would um, hammer the tropics a bit and, you know, wipe out a lot of habitats marginal to the tropics. Secondly, if you think about the, uh, the sea levels, and sea levels were very high in the Ordovician, it was a warm climate and um, probably several hundred metres higher than today, but the ice would suck in the water. And so basically what we're talking about is a drop in sea level of about 100, 150 metres during the first phase. And this obviously is going to restrict the shelf areas that a lot of the organisms were living on. And so the classical model is that the, the communities on the shelves and on the slope, they become more and more compressed towards the edge of the shelf and the upper slope. And so that would have a, a species area effect. But also there'd be an overturn in the waters. So in the warm climates, the oceans tend to be quite well stratified. The moment you come into an ice age, there's a lot more overturn as um, cold waters tip off the ice sheets and start moving towards the equator. And this is bringing up some sort of ill-conditioned waters up the slope onto the deeper parts of the shelves. And we think these sorts of waters with a bit of anoxia would have wiped out the deep water faunas. The second phase, as sea levels rose and the ice melted, this seems to have been more widespread and there's a lot more anoxia about. And so that more or less wiped out a lot of habitats across the shelves. And the causes of the causes? The cause of the causes, <laughs> which um, is, is out there. And a number of papers uh, recently have pointed to the presence of mercury through some of these late Ordovician successions. And this could be, you know, associated with volcanicity. Now, we don't have a huge amount of evidence for volcanoes, but well, why should we? Because so much crust is lost from the Ordovician. But there is the possibility out there that some sort of volcanicity kicked off this whole process. So we know a lot about the habitat destruction. We know what the habitat destruction did to all these organisms. But why we kicked into that major ice age we're still looking for answers. What animals really struggled during this mass extinction? Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of losses at this time, so it's estimated there were maybe about 85% of species in the seas actually became extinct, which sounds absolutely huge. But actually, no major group of animals went completely extinct. None of them lost everything, really. But there were some groups that were worse affected than others, and it seems to link to where they were living in the oceans, how they were living. So, for example, animals that were living at the bottom of the sea, quite sedentary animals just sat there, like brachiopods, like corals and um, sea bats and the sea lilies that we talked about. They seemed to be quite badly affected, the ones that were kind of stuck on the bottom, if you like. And also free swimming animals as well, the ones that were living in the plankton also seemed to be badly affected. So the graptolites that I mentioned earlier, they were badly affected. The conodonts. And the nautiloids as well were quite badly affected. So there were several groups. And um, yeah, it did seem to link to their ecology. Where were they actually living in the seas? Did any groups do well? Did any seem to survive unscathed or rebound very quickly after the end of the Ordovician? Well, some of the groups I just mentioned has been badly hit. So things like the brachiopods and the graptolites and the corals and the sea lilies. 
they actually rebounded fairly quickly. They lost a lot of diversity at the time, but they did come back to diversify and be very successful indeed in the sound area. So they actually recovered quite well. Although obviously some of their groups were gone forever, some kind of subfamilies or whatever. And sponges also appear to have come through quite unscathed. They are often the animal that first appears when communities are re-establishing after the end ordovician mass extinction. So the very early Silurian is just a world of sponges if you go to these hard-hit areas. <laughs> um, yeah, in some parts of the world, that's all you get initially. And then these other things like the brachiopods and so on then recolonize. So some people think it might be because the sponges have this role in filtering the water and they maybe stabilize things a bit in the oceans. Oh, right. It's an idea. What I would say is important is the condition of the ecosystem. And what happens in some of the major extinction events, the end Permian, the end Cretaceous, is that the the ecosystem really collapses. So what happens is life survives. Life is a great survivor, but not necessarily the type of biosphere that um, was prior to the extinction event. However, with the end Ordovician extinction event, yes, we do see some big ecological changes, but nothing huge. The sorts of communities, structures that we have across the shelf into deep water, they bounce back quite quickly. Okay, they might have slightly different organisms in these niches, but that general ecosystem is pretty similar. So if you compare the Silurian to the Ordovician, yes, some of the main characters have changed, but the basic structure of uh, the ecosystem is more or less the same. So it is quite a big taxonomic extinction, but it's not a big ecological extinction. How did trilobites fare specifically in the end Ordovician mass extinction? They were quite badly hit in some ways, so they lost um, two of their major groups, and a third group was reduced just to one species, so they lost um, quite a lot in terms of the actual diversity in that way. And I think around half of their families disappeared completely, so in that respect they did lose quite a lot. Like the previous groups we mentioned, they did rebound relatively quickly after the extinction and they did diversify in the Silurian period as well. But I don't think they ever kind of regained the diversity that they'd had in the Cambrian and the Ordovician periods that came before. From then on, it was probably a decline for them, I suspect, in terms of the different numbers of um, species and so on. So this really was the end of their golden age. Although, having said that, They still clung on for, is it another 200 million years after the Ordovician? That's right, yeah, yeah, they hung on until the next big one, I guess the end Permian mass extinction, which finally did for them, but by that time they were very seriously in decline. But still pretty tenacious animals in terms of survival. Indeed, yeah, yeah, they had a very long reign, yeah, (laughs) very impressive. Well... I should probably let my two guests return to the Holocene. But while the Morella surfaces, there's just time for both of them to share their must-see Ordovician experience. When we come into the late Ordovician and we get shell beds made of pentamerid brachiopods, and I've worked a lot in Greenland, and in North Greenland, in the late Ordovician, there are great thicknesses of these big brachiopods hundreds of meters of shell beds. And these shell beds actually stretch across into Canada and down into the Great Basin in the States. And they pop up other places in the Arctic as well. And I'm just thinking for somebody walking out into the sea and walking over these shell beds, rather like oyster beds today, that just massive brachiopods crunching under your feet. And as you get out into the deeper water, looking at the huge thicknesses of these pentamerid shell beds that stretch for thousands of kilometers. And what an incredible sight. And how much calcium carbonate they used to actually build those valves. How much carbon dioxide did they take out in the atmosphere? Incredible. Just think about the huge expanse of these huge brachiopods. And how about you, Lucy? Well, I'm a huge trilobite fan, so for me, it would have to be seeing one of these big trilobites. So there's a trilobite called Isotelus rex, which is the biggest trilobite that's ever lived, and it lived in the Ordovician. We reckon it was about 70 centimetres long and maybe 40 centimetres wide, so quite an impressive beast. So I'd quite like to see that. And, And also it lived in sort of shallow seas in the region of the equator, so actually quite nice 
scuba diving territory, I think. So that would be my must-see <laughs> experience. Sounds like a very good trip, yeah. Yeah. And all that's left for me to say is thank you very much to my two guests, Dr. Lucy McCobb and Professor Dave Harper, for sharing their advice on swimming, snorkeling, and staying alive in the Ordovician. If you've enjoyed what we've been talking about today, then make sure to check out their research. There are links in the episode notes. And most of all, thank you to you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and if you have, please feel free to like, subscribe, share, and leave a positive review. And I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory. But until then, safe travels. Mm